The first thing I'd like to do is to, is to talk to you about the evidence base for turnaround schools. And I'm going to talk specifically about the work that we have done in both uh, Tennessee and North Carolina because I want to acquaint you as closely as possible to the data that we have about what is actually working and what we uh, are yet to see effects from. Uh, then I would like to, uh, as the third part in, in response to questions, I would like to lay out some of the considerations and concerns as you contemplate uh, the idea of an achievement school district. Some of the things that, uh, that have come up in Tennessee that I hope you'll, you'll consider uh, during this process because we, um, we learned by doing uh, in Tennessee and a lot has been learned in the last uh, uh, five years uh, under the race to the top. So um, we've got a lot to cover and a little time, so I'm just going to jump in if that's all right with everybody. Um, so what does uh, school turnaround in Tennessee look like? Let me just uh, acquaint you a little bit with this, and uh, if we, uh, we can certainly deal with, uh, with uh, questions later. Um, Tennessee, uh, as Representative Meyer indicated, uh, received uh, race to the top funds in the first round. Tennessee received this. Uh, North Carolina received funds in the second round. Uh, they identified 82 of the lowest achieving schools, which I'm going to refer to as priority schools. And those schools were the schools uh, that the Achievement School District was authorized to take over. Uh, and the Achievement School District, when it was set up, went about doing its work in two different ways. First of all, uh, they recruited charter management organizations, which are uh, organizations running charter schools to come in to run uh, some of these schools uh, that were, just some of these 82 priority schools that were identified. Um, the charter uh, management organizations um, now have about 20 schools out of that 82 in their, in their group. I've got a table later. Uh, they also directly ran another group of those schools uh, in, in the first year they began to take over and run as a district themselves. Uh, of course, the Achievement School District was headed up by Chris Barbic, who'd been a successful uh, charter uh, uh, initiator and um, uh, came in with a huge amount of dynamism there. The, the, the fundamental difference that we have to get our heads wrapped around is that these schools are not schools of choice. These are neighborhood schools, which presents them with different issues than managing a charter school. So when you're initiating a charter school in a new building, for instance, uh, you can take uh, grade by grade and build uh, the students from the, often from the kindergarten to first grade uh, up through the end of the uh, uh, schooling in that particular school. But a charter, uh, a neighborhood school has to operate as a neighborhood school with all grades and all students uh, who are in that neighborhood having a chance to attend. So one of the things that we'll discuss today, and I've got listed in the issues, that um, is, um, is how do you, how do you uh, manage the needs of students with disabilities, for instance, uh, pre presenting a formidable challenge and there's a high proportion of students in these turnaround schools with those kinds of needs. So how, as a neighborhood school, instead of a school of choice, does a charter organization handle those issues? Uh, even to the point of, of having the records for, uh, for the students' uh, individual education plans transferred correctly and making sure they're assigned to the correct services. So we can cover off on some of those issues uh, as we go through. So uh, uh, in addition to the ASD, Charter Managed and Direct Run Schools, Tennessee has a third innovation that is going on, and those are called Innovation Zones and, or I-Zones. Innovation Zones are uh, in three of our large urban areas, Memphis, uh, the majority of Memphis, Nashville, and Chattanooga. And I believe that um, uh, Alan spoke to you all uh, uh, recently about uh, some of those efforts. Uh, they, um, 
One of the things that we have to recognize in school turnaround is that one of the success stories associated with No Child Left Behind is we now know where these schools are. And the kids we know where we need to intervene on behalf of the students and families in those schools. Um, but it doesn't tell us what to do. We know something needs to happen. There needs to be an action forcing mechanism. But then how we operate, and there's almost no research that tells us that it was done prior to Race to the Top how to do this. There's, there, there's no, nothing that uh, I would say meets the standards for high quality research about these schools. So uh, we know we need to intervene. In, in the local urban districts, um, one, of the, uh, one of the factors that plays into the reluctance to treat these schools differently is that local school districts would like to have all their schools treated the same way. But the data shows treating all schools the same way will leave some schools in a horrible shape and the students and their families still serve. So there has to be an action forcing mechanism to get that to happen. And in Tennessee, uh, once the authority for, uh, for uh, who raised to the top with Achievement School District was established, these three districts took some of their schools out of the district and managed them separately as ISOs. So when I talk about ISOs, they're not in the state uh, authority, but the action to do that may have been motivated by the authority to do this uh, being manifest in the state. So there have been numerous issues, and, and uh, some of them have been dealt with uh, very effectively. I'll, I'll uh, save that for the end, because I'd like to have a chance to talk to you about the, uh, the results that we see. So we, uh, we've evaluated the impacts for three groups of schools. First of all, for those 82 schools I talked about in total, uh, about a third of them went into the ASD, about a third of them went into the I zones, and about a third of them have had no reform, uh, systematic reform efforts at all. So those schools, all of them have been named and labeled as the lowest performing, but some of them, only two thirds of them, have received systematic reform. So that allows us to compare these reform efforts. Uh, we have the I zone, again. That is probably an initiative that can only take place in urban schools with the capacity and will to treat these schools differently. Because continuing to do and treat them as they, uh, as they have been treated in the past will only yield the results that we've seen in the past, which are completely unacceptable. So um, then we've got the ASD schools, and I'm going to break that down by the ASD direct run and the CMO, Charter Management Organization, run schools. Um, I'm going to look at uh, impacts with you today on reading and math, and I've got some science scores as well, because Tennessee has uh, tests in science um, as well in the, in the early grades, throughout the early grades. I'm going to look at, at achievement scores rather than proficiency rates. The reason I do that, a proficiency rate just measures one point on that whole distribution that student who moves from not proficient to proficient. And we want a measure that's more sensitive to the learning going on throughout the school. And I'm going to express these in terms, and, and please, um, uh, I'm, I probably will beg your forgiveness on a number of uh, levels today about the presentation, but this one is particularly important. Um, I want you to be able to compare what happens in, in uh, North Carolina to Tennessee, and what happens from uh, let's say that one of the most respected studies uh, ever was the Tennessee Star class size experiments. They produced an effect of approximately 22% of a standard deviation. Okay, I know that probably hurts for you just to say that. But I'm going to put all of these effects in the same metric. And to do that, they're going to be in standard deviation units. I hope not to say that again today, but I just want you to have that context. So, so just think about the cost of reducing class size 
from 25 to uh, somewhere around 15. That produced 22% of the standard deviation effect. So all these effects are going to be comparable to that effect. So that's the reason I'm, I'm complexifying things. I'm a, I'm a paid card-carrying professor. I'm paid to complexify things. So, uh, so uh, I'm going to use uh, standard deviation units. We did a natural experiment. Uh, and that is to say, we looked at the trend before these schools changed and after, and to see if the growth and change in those achievement scores was more after for particular groups receiving an intervention than other groups, than schools that did not receive that intervention. So we're going to compare those ASD and I-Zone schools to priority schools that received no um, uh, no direct intervention. Uh, so we can't completely control, but um, it's, it's close enough for, some, for, uh, for the science that, that we do these days. It's, uh, this simply shows you the breakout. So one of the things you need to consider, when I talk about North Carolina, uh, one of the first things I'm going to tell you is it, uh, North Carolina had uh, the most ambitious school turnaround program in the country. What do I mean by that? They identified about 110 plus schools and they intervened in all 110 uh, throughout the years of Race to the Top. Tennessee identified, as I said, 82 initially and the 84, you see, how, how did they identify more? Because they're going to say, well, that's actually school splitting as a result of taking over particular grades uh, and so forth. And then 77 is a result of closing as well as adding some Schools, and we could talk about that particularly. But you'll see that um, the, uh, in total, the ASD was operating uh, uh, about uh, 23 schools, the I-Zone 26 schools, and the remainder were not being uh, provided with any systematic reform. So what happened across the board with the 82 in Tennessee? Across the board, we have small <coughs> positive effects in math and science, no effect in reason, overall. So uh, those 82 schools, some of which received reform, some of which didn't, we see small positive effects. When we start to look at specifically all of those ASD, both the charter and the direct run, there are no statistically significant effects. And this is after three years of operation in the schools that were taken over first. So break that down further uh, to ask the question, um, do we see uh, larger effects in certain cohorts than others? So one might expect it takes a while to have an effect. And we think that's probably true, although you'll see in North Carolina that's not true. The effects were, were positive in the media. Um, so uh, we, we look here by cohort. So, so this is the first group, uh, I believe six schools that came in, and you see that uh, the effects uh, are not statistically significant uh, uh, in any year, including the third year they were in operation. For cohort two, we have a substantial negative effect on math in the first year. This is a, a uh, you remember I said 0.22 or 22% of the standard deviation unit? I'm sorry, I said it again. Now we get half the standard deviation, twice but the wrong direction, twice the size of class reduction, wrong direction. The next year it rebounds, and so um, you, you'll hear a lot uh, of, of support that the scores went up in 2015 for ASD. Uh, but the, as you'll see, the magnitude of the upside is so they rebounded, but they didn't rebound as much as they'd gone down the previous year. So they're still behind where they were compared to these other schools in the movement in those other schools. Uh, the, the third year uh, cohort has just been there for one year uh, uh, through the end of the last school year, and there's no effect there. So breaking it down by ASD run, do we see more promise there? or CMO run. We see a small positive effect in the third year uh, on math in the ASD run, and in the second year after a negative effect uh, the prior year in the second cohort. 
So um, we take this to suggest that the ASD run, direct run schools uh, have more positive effects than the charter managed uh, uh, schools in Tennessee. When we look at science, we see again in that first cohort, uh, uh, small positive effects in the first year, in the third year, uh, no effects in later years. Uh, in the, in, in, uh, the second cohort, the third cohort has a large, uh, a moderate negative effect, about the same size as the class size reduction that I talked about, but the, but the opposite direction for the third year. So uh, from this, we have concluded that while there are a few years of positive uh, uh, and negative effects, overall there, uh, there are little to no effects of the ASD schools on achievement after three years. So the ambitious goal of getting all 82 schools in the top 25% has not been attained. A, a so what about the I-Zone schools? So in reading, math, and science, we see uh, moderate to small positive effects across the board. Every subject across the board for um, most, uh, the I zones have grown over the years, but the largest, largest chunk of these schools were taken in in the first year. So we do see uh, positive effects. Now, uh, again, I, I don't want to dismiss the fact that these districts have had these schools in poor performance for a number of years, and without that action forcing mechanism, it may not have been, we may not have seen this growth. Okay, so they need to be motivated to do something about the dire uh, circumstances and outcomes for these children. So um, was this a fluke? Did it, did it happen someplace? So Memphis is our most challenged urban environment in Tennessee. Um, higher rates of poverty in these schools. Uh, we're virtually all of these schools in, in, uh, are, are dealing with uh, 98, 99, 100% economically disadvantaged students. There, uh, but you see every year in every subject a positive effect of the eyes on the schools. Uh, in Chattanooga, we see positive effects um, in reading. In, uh, in Nashville, we see positive effects in math. So each of the eye zones return some positive effects uh, in, in some subjects, but uh, Memphis in all three subjects. So. Um, so our view of this is that the I-zones um, can be effective. We, we did a lot of analysis, because I, 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 would, I would bet that one of the first things that uh, you're thinking about there was this cherry picking. Did they pick the schools just, who were just about to succeed, and they found those schools and they made them success stories? We cannot find any evidence that they picked stronger or weaker schools. Neither did uh, ASD, to their credit. They didn't cherry pick schools either. Um, they, uh, what we do know is uh, one of the ways that they recruited teachers was offer larger uh, teacher salaries into these ISO schools. And so uh, when we look at hiring, we see actually for teachers who had experience in um, uh, TVOS scores, which are the same as uh, similar methodology as your EVOS scores, the, uh, the ASD state-run uh, schools, direct-run schools, had the highest uh, quality talent pool <coughs> selected, but the I-Zones were second. So the I-Zones were recruiting really good teachers, bringing them in, uh, providing autonomy along their school days, more autonomy to the school, and those um, were paying off in terms of student outcomes. So um, we at the conclusions for this study, 23 schools were under the auspices of ASD, 26 in I-Zones. Um, uh, 16, only 16 of the 23 ASD schools are included in the analysis. Uh, mainly that's because the schools didn't have a tested grade or subject in them, uh, or they uh, came for one year and then were closed after that year. Uh, we can go more into that. Um, overall, priority schools as a whole have small positive effects. Overall, I-Zone schools have moderate to large positive effects in all three subjects that were tested uh, and consistent effects in Memphis 
And finally, um, the ASD schools themselves did not gain more <coughs> or less than other priority schools that did not receive systemic reform, controlling for a whole bunch of other differences uh, when we do this model. So um, the, the, um, a, a, a valid question to raise is, would we have seen the I-Zone uh, effects without the ASD? And, and that's a question that we just can't answer from these data because we had both operating at once. But we do see large positive effects in the I-Zone. So I would say um, from, the, from the literature standpoint, uh, this is uh, some of the strongest evidence that's available about, uh, about the effects of these turnarounds and especially about charter uh, uh, turnaround effects.